Take your Bibles and open up to Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> we'll be in verse 21 through 43. Rather lengthy passage. It's one you're familiar with. I've preached on it before. Brother Wes has preached on it recently. There's a lot there. Um, and uh, certainly this morning, I think God will speak to our hearts. I appreciate our praise team doing such a wonderful job uh, week in and week out. Uh, we are truly blessed um, with Wes and Hannah and their leadership. And then also all those uh, instrumentalists back there. And also in the sound booth. And uh, sometimes you get called to do things you never thought you were going to do. Right, Amy? <laughs> and I appreciate her willingness to get up in there and, and help. Um, and man, the songs that we sang um, fit in with this message and with what God is doing to reveal himself to us. Uh, this morning my message is awakening and up until this point, Jesus, a man of action in Mark, is going from place to place, doing miracle after miracle, and already he's uh, healed a man who was born lame and restored him completely right there in front of people. Um, he has uh, cast out demons. He has done incredible miracle, healing miracles. And uh, today he's going to go even beyond that. And do something even more incredible. This uh, lesson today is a demonstration of God's uh, awesome power. And that Jesus, once again, he's not just a man. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a, a rabbi or a scribe, um, a good person. He's not just a miracle worker. He is... Uh, the Son of God. He is exactly who he claimed uh, to be. So um, he has power over disease and he has power over death. And in Mark's account, Jesus is progressing forward. The story is moving to the ultimate question for all of us, for myself and for you, and for every person who's ever been encountered with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The ultimate question in chapter 8, verse 29, Jesus asked it of his disciples in that day, and I believe that he is asking it of us even today. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Am I a good man? Am I a good teacher? Am I a miracle worker? Or am I the son of the living God? Let's stand as we read this passage today, beginning in verse 21. It's rather lengthy. If you need to sit, that's fine. Um, I'm going to read through verse 43. So when Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side... A large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up on seeing him and fell at his feet. And he implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. A woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately... The flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, 
turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garment? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. And the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what is being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, and immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given her to eat. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of his word. You may be seated. Here we have an awakening. We see Jesus' power over the greatest enemy of man, death. And the man of action is moving towards the healing of this little girl when he is interrupted by another situation and he takes care to meet the needs there and bring healing into this woman. There's a desire here, a desire by the synagogue ruler to see his daughter healed, a desire by the um, woman who has gone 12 years without having to be able to have interaction with people because she was considered unclean. There's discouragement in this woman's life. Jesus is detoured. He didn't stop. He didn't say, well, I'm, I just won't go. Even when they came and said, well, it's too late. with a little bit maybe of inference that if, well, if you would have rushed, if you would have hurried, if you wouldn't have been delayed, you would have been able to take care of this little girl. There was death, our greatest enemy, what we fear most. And lastly, a demonstration that Jesus was exactly who he said. He was. So in verse 21 through 24, we see this desire. Now, I just got to tell you, I've had four kids. I had three daughters, one son. And I can't imagine if I had a child that was near death, how distraught I would be, how fearful I would be and some of you have gone through and experienced this with a child with a grandchild could you imagine as brother Neil testified this morning living in a place like Haiti where they literally don't even have the medicines the technology the doctors the hospitals like we do nowhere to take them matter of fact I was talking with a pastor in Haiti one time and he flat out told me that you'll see many more miracles and spiritual warfare in a place like Haiti. He said, and he had been to America, studied over here, 
He said, in America, you tend to rely on the medicines and the technologies that God has given to bring healing. He said, we don't have that in Haiti. So we have to believe in faith and trust in the Lord. Jarius was at that point. He desired for his 12-year-old daughter to be well again and probably like the woman who was going to come and interrupt Jesus as he was going to bring healing into Jairus' daughter. He'd probably tried everything. He was a synagogue official. He was well known in the community, not really a preacher, but part of the synagogue and was well known, possibly well liked, popular, with influence. So surely everything that could have been done had been done. And so with no other hope, his desire to see his daughter live brought him to the feet of Jesus. She was literally in the last stages of whatever disease she had. Death was imminent. And so his desire brought him to Jesus. In verse 22, he fell at his feet as an act of worship, as an act of submission, as an act of this is my last hope, my last opportunity, nothing else I can do. So I trust in you, Lord. And many times... That is is exactly how it is with us. Before we'll go to Jesus, we'll try everything else. Medicines, technology, wisdom and knowledge of our doctors, education, whatever it might be. Well-meaning, but I just wonder, what if we went to Jesus first? What if we fell at His feet first? What if we came to Him with all of our hope? And just said, Lord, it's in your hands. What would we experience there? Well, Jesus' desire was to go and minister to Jairus. Jairus' desire was for his daughter to be made well. Jesus' desire was to do what he could do to help. That's why Jesus, one of the reasons he came. To help us. Not only to help us with the physical things of life, like our health and what we eat as he fed 5,000, that even in the midst of the storms and the raging wind as we some felt yesterday, God's in control of it all. I shared this this morning in our Sunday school class. My lovely teacher wife needed to run to the school yesterday. And we went over there and I saw the cloud. I said, ooh, that looks promising. Have you checked your radar on your phone? I said, we probably need to do that. We were in the classroom about 15 minutes when we left. I noticed the cloud had moved and kind of was coming back towards us. I said, we better check that radar when we get back to the house. As we got to the house, the winds began to blow. I said, I think we're fixing to get something. We went to go clear our back patio off like we normally do. And before we got finished, boom, it hit. But one of the things that happened in the in-between was we stopped. And my wife said, we need to pray. And we literally held hands and said, Lord, you know the need. We need rain. I'm just going to tell you. When you pray for rain, you better expect some wind. And the winds blew, but the rains came. Not everybody got rain, but we did. And I felt like the Lord was in it. And we thanked Him. Yes, my fence blew down and blew apart. Yes, we had limbs fall down. Yes, there was some things torn up. As far as I know, there was no injuries. There was no death. Blessed be the name of the Lord, God Almighty. He answers prayer. 
Jesus' desire is to help us and minister to us and show his love to us. And so he was about to do that. Now we see the discouragement in verse 25 through 28. The woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years. 12 years of a health issue that made her ceremonially and in the midst of her community unclean. She was a total outcast. She had endured much, it says in verse 26. She spent all she had. Now some of you have done this and you know about that. And it only made it worse. I'd, some of y'all could get up and testify about going to the doctor and everything they gave you, it just made it worse. Or maybe caused other problems and issues. Have you ever seen the drug commercials on the TV? You know, take this for an upset stomach. And then you got, you know, three minutes of, but it also may cause bloating, gas, diarrhea, da -da 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 -da, all these other symptoms and things. This lady, it says, endured much. Now, I just want to tell you, it's kind of interesting, but as, as I was studying this lesson and reading about it, and of course you have this account, and then you also have Luke's account. Luke was a doctor. I'm just going to tell you, in interestingly enough, if you compare the two accounts, you'll notice Mark is not as kind to the physicians as Luke was. Go read it. Mark basically says, these physicians couldn't do anything. They tried everything and nothing worked. Nothing helped. It only made it worse. That's discouraging. There's nothing worse than not knowing what's wrong. I've been doing hospital ministry, sick ministry, helping ministry for 20 to 30 years now. And in a lot of ways, even once you get the diagnosis, whether it's you've got to have bypass surgery or you have cancer, there is some measure of relief to that in knowing, okay, now I know the problem and at least we know how to fight it. When you don't know and there's no answers and the doctors and you, maybe you've seen many doctors and as I have seen in some situations and they just can't find the problem. How discouraging is that? And that's what this woman had gone through. But guess what? When you're down to nothing, I mean when you've tried everything, just like Jairus had. And now this woman, Jesus is up to something. Amen? I mean, sometimes that's what it takes is us in our human mindset, we will try everything. We'll do everything. Everything I can do. Everything other people can do. Everything the government can do. And finally, when we are at the very bottom, we'll look up and say, Jesus. I need you. And he's ready to show up immediately. So, in this passage, we see the desire. The desire of Jairus for healing. It was the same desire that the woman had. The woman wanted to be healed, but probably even more than that, she just wanted to be loved, cared for. We see the discouragement in her life she had tried everything, spent every dime she had, and no healing would come but Jesus. The detour, verse 29 through 34. Immediately, it says, I'm not going to go into all the nuances and details, but immediately after she touched it, she had enough faith and believed and heard enough about Jesus that she thought to herself, if I just touch the hem of his garment, and bam, immediately, just reaching out, just struggling and straining. By the way, the women all, they weren't allowed to walk right there with Jesus and the disciples. The women all had to follow behind back in those days. And so a woman straining up through the crowd, 
a crowd of men to get up to Jesus. And probably it was like, what, what's she doing? Who does she think she is? What's going on there? And by the way, she couldn't declare, oh, I'm unclean, which is what she was supposed to do according to the ceremonial law. She just forced her way, worked her way through the crowd till she got to Jesus just struggling and straining and reaching. Literally, in my mind, I think, according to the scriptures that I read, she dove. She dove for it. Thinking to herself, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And I think... She dove for it. And I think her fingers just brushed maybe the back of his robe. And boom! That's what it says in Scripture. Verse 29, immediately. Boom! She was healed. She knew it immediately. Jesus knew it immediately. Boom! She was healed. Wow! Wow! That's the detour, folks. This is what got Jesus off course. This is what delayed him from going where he was going to heal Jairus' daughter. She knew it immediately. Jesus knew it immediately. Power, spiritual energy went out from him. But Jesus stopped. Why did he stop? Why not just keep going? She was healed no, because she needed something else. She needed more. Verse 30, immediately Jesus perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched me? Now, he knew who touched her. I mean, he knew who touched him. Um, but Jesus was going to test her faith. Not because she needed to be tested, but for her own inner peace. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. That's basically what is happening right here. And his disciples said, first of all, they're like, who touched you? What do you mean, who touched you? Look at all these people. And he turned around and looked to see the woman who had done this. So he already knew who she was. The woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what happened, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Laid it all. I just had no hope. And I felt like if I touched your garment, I could be healed. That was the whole truth. She believed. She believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, who takes away the sins of the world. She believed in Him, and she touched Him. And her faith, look at what Jesus says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now think about that. Wasn't she already healed of her affliction? Then why did Jesus say that? Because there was something else she needed to be healed of. She needed the peace of knowing that God loved her. God cared about her. And now you have been made whole. And she was able to testify right there in front of all those men. God loves me. He healed me. And I am now clean. Clean before him and clean before you. She had totally been made whole once again. She was saved. The word there, healed, translates in the Greek, saved. Like we all need to be. So that's the detour. And the detour leads to death. Verse 35, And while he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the master, the teacher, anymore? Now, first of all, 
Jesus says, she's not dead. She's sleeping. And, and of course, they laugh. They just break out in laughter. Now, remember, in verse 30, we have immediately Jesus. Immediately Jesus. Okay? But look at verse 36. Then we see, but Jesus, overhearing what was spoken, said to the synagogue official, don't be afraid any longer, only believe. And he takes the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, the three closest to him, the three that are really going to do most of the work at the beginning of the church after Jesus leaves And he allows them to go into the house when he gets there with the girl's parents. In Luke 8, 53, it says, knowing she was dead. Here they say, well, your daughter has died. Luke, the physician, adds a little bit more strength to it. Maybe pride, like, She's dead. We know she's dead. We checked on her and she's dead. There's no pulse and she's dead. There's no hope because she's dead. That's the end. Death is the end. Have y'all ever heard of God's acre? Y'all ever heard of that term? Anybody? Anybody know what that is? Henry does. You know what God's acre is? It's a cemetery. You know, back in the old days, the cemeteries were next to the churches. Because all those people that were out there belonged to the Lord. That's his land. That's his property. That's sacred ground. Holy ground, if you will. But it's... Where everyone is at rest. They're going to rest. That's what it is. Look at verse 39. And entering in, he said, Why make a commotion and weep? The child hasn't died but is asleep. All throughout the New Testament, Paul wrote two-thirds of it. He almost exclusively uses the Greek word for sleep to describe death. You see, death is not the end. Death is basically a doorway that we pass through and go into eternity. And so Jesus says, don't weep. The child has not died, but is merely asleep. Hmm. A sleeping place. That's what a cemetery is. Place of rest. A sleeping place. Now I'm just telling you, this passage is full of awakening. That's why I titled this message, Awakening. It's let's wake up, people. Let's have faith. We're not supposed to live like everybody else in the world. We're supposed to live by faith, not by sight. Verse 30, it says, and immediately Jesus. Immediately Jesus. Now, how many of you have experienced immediately Jesus in your life, in a situation, in a difficulty, in the loss of of someone that you cared about or loved, or maybe a health situation, and then immediately Jesus showed up? Because let me just tell you, that's what the people out there in the world are waiting for. They're waiting for Jesus. You say, but preacher, yes, I know, but, 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 but 36, but Jesus. But Jesus. And as long as you've got Jesus, then it's all good. Whether he decides to heal or not, we're in his hands. We trust in him. But Jesus. When you get the phone call that you dread, you know it's coming. Or maybe you don't know it's coming. And it's a total shock and a surprise. The 
verse that we can go to and remember is, but Jesus, in the midst of loss, or, or in the midst of knowing there's no hope in anything that this world has to offer, the surgeons, the doctors, the medicines, the pharmacies, the technology, the government, all of that. When you realize there's nothing else, then let's fall down at his feet and remember, but we have Jesus. Amen? Over all this other stuff. And so then we see the demonstration, the awakening, if you will, of this child. He's, Jesus already proved he's got power over nature, over uh, demons, over the physical body. He's healed many different people by this point. And now he's going to prove and show, at least to his inner circle. By the way, if there's a bunch of people standing around mourning and wailing and weeping because the child's dead, and then all of a sudden Jesus walks out with the child... They're going to know something happened. Now, yeah, Jesus tells them, don't say anything. But I'm pretty sure they thought, well, something's up. Either Jesus was right and a child wasn't dead, but was merely sleeping. Oh, well, yeah. But in our human language, the child was dead. And Jesus says, Talitha kum, which translated means... Little girl, I say to you, get up. Or little girl, arise. Awaken. Awaken. And look at, there it is again. Immediately, the girl, she didn't yawn. And you know how they do it on TV. No. Man, all of a sudden, she's there. Her spirit is back in her body. And it is made whole. And she is complete. And she gets up and to show Jesus love and compassion for us as humans in all of our frailty, he says, oh, by the way, she's hungry. It's pretty taxing, you know, when you're dead. So uh, she hadn't ate maybe in a while. Uh, man, go get her some a steak or something, I guess. I don't know. But she's, you know, feed her. And so the demonstration of power, she was now alive power unlike anything an atomic bomb air show you go see these jet planes and what they can do it's unbelievable the technology and things we have I love cars drag races top fuel funny a car with an engine that has 3,000 horsepower you're gonna hang on to that thing all these things that we have but Jesus has all power, all authority. It's all been given to him. He is God, the Son, in the flesh. He's got power over death, the grave, and our sins, by the way. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so what I'm saying to you today is quit waiting, quit stalling, quit searching, but Jesus. Amen? And guess what? He's waiting on you with open arms to just come to Him. And so I'm telling you today, what are you waiting on? You waiting on something better? It ain't coming. Something different? Something more? Well, maybe the government will save me. Don't get your hopes up. I'm telling you, folks, openly, publicly, declare with your life, Jesus. I believe in Jesus. The Jesus of this book, that's the gospel. The Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. Declare it openly publicly, quit being afraid, quit worrying about what other people will think or say about you. Get baptized as a public profession of your faith. Do it. Why 
wait any longer. Immediately, the girl got up and began to walk. She was 12 years old, and immediately, they were completely astounded. The, la- the last immediately of the past, their, j- their jaws. She was dead. I've had one experience where I was at a car wreck scene with a young woman in a car that was dying literally right before my eyes and all I knew to do was pray for her. I don't have any special abilities or anything like that. It was a horrible car wreck. It was on I-45 and it was real bad fog. That young lady passed away. But I prayed, Lord, if this lady, this young lady, she was a college student headed back to U of H. Didn't know her, didn't know her name. I just said, Lord, if this lady, this young lady doesn't know you, then allow her to live. If she doesn't know you, allow her to live. If she does, and if it's your will, then take her. That's all I knew to pray. I don't know what the answer is. I hope when I enter into the kingdom, that young lady will come up and give me a big hug and say, I was saved because I already knew Jesus. And your prayer was answered. All power, all authority has been given to him. Quit stalling, quit waiting on searching and something else. You'll find it in Jesus. Today can be the day of your salvation. Let's pray. Almighty God and Father in heaven, take this time and use it according to your will and way. May our hearts and our minds be tuned in to what your Holy Spirit is speaking to us at this time. And if there's anyone here that doesn't have a relationship with you through your Son, Jesus Christ, may today be the day when they enter into eternity with Jesus. And we pray it in His name. Amen.